This is Canoramic, and we're bringing you cannabis like you've never seen it before. Today we have our wonderful edibles and more chef, D. Russell, here with us from Nevada, where things are always exciting and you're doing a lot of great work out there. You are a medical marijuana cannabis uh, consultant. You are a chef. You call yourself the happy chef. Um, you are a, um, you do production, you work at a facility or you, you consult with a dispensary. So you have that kind of scientific edge there too. And the reason why we wanted to have you here was because you bring not only the creating of the delicious edibles, but also the kind of scientific piece that I think people are missing when they read about edibles. And you wrote a book about this, which I think is you know, the piece uh, that everyone needs is called The Happy Chef, and you break all of this down. So welcome to Canoramic. Enlighten us with all of your wisdom. First of all, tell us, how did you get into the cannabis space? Wow. Oh, well, uh, first off, thank you for the amazing introduction. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been in the cannabis industry a little over 10 years. Um, I, I'm originally from Virginia, and uh, that's where I, I, I began. My culinary skills were derived from. In Virginia, I used to run restaurants and uh, uh, in Norfolk and then also in Virginia Beach. And then um, I had the unfortunate um, event of I lost my sister due to a prescription drug overdose. And at that time, um, my family grew up very holistic anyway. Uh, my family still lives in the country where, you know, if, we, if we're making green beans that night, my mom's like, Dee, go outside and pick some green beans for dinner. Love that. Woo! It's very from, you know, farm to table where I'm from. So, um, and that's in Franklin County, Virginia. So it's like we all moved to the city and, you know, all kind of branched out, me and my other siblings. But when I lost my sister is kind of when, um, kind of when I really like dove head first. I was already very, very focused in food, very focused in like, a, a, you know, an herbalist. Um, I love all that. I believe that food is medicine. I believe that uh, not even just cannabis, but like fungi and like what you eat. It's probiotics, antibiotics, it's everything you put in your body is, is, you know, that's what keeps us going is our fuel. And everybody's different. So when I got into the cannabis space, it was honestly, I just love the plant. I, I absolutely love it. it I, I've been self-medicating and self-healing myself for over 10 years through, you know, I, I have rheumatoid and osteoarthritis as well as my mom. And then um, when I started getting into cannabis research, I was partnered with a medical cannabis research company. And then when you get to see the compounds, how they interact with each other and the benefits and you actually put it to work, it's a very exciting time because you know 10 years ago, we weren't able to study the plant like we are now. So me and, me and research, it's only been about four, four to five years. And just even that, like what all the new like lab tests and uh, you know research and results that are coming from like Dr. Evan Russo about Lenalool and you know that was back in 2009. Like everything's kind of coming to fruit and people are actually getting back to Mother Earth, which it's kind of funny. This is actually Earth Day. Ah yes. So, you know, happy yeah. Earth Day. So, you know, be nice so, so you talk about uh, you know food being medicine and how everything we put in our body matters and you know this whole journey of how you got to medical cannabis. Um, I'm sorry to the cannabis space. I was just talking with um, uh, Dr. Mashulam, who is the father of cannabis research, and he was talking about how there really has not been a ton of clinical trials that have happened over the years since his discovery of THC and the endocannabinoid system and all those other things, there really hasn't been a lot of clinical trials that have given people exact relief from their symptoms like rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. Uh, there are not a lot of drugs out there. So when you talk about self-medicating, isn't that what most people are doing right now? They're, they're essentially trying to figure it out on their own. And, you know, um, I, this is a going catchphrase that I have. It's like, what do you call a doctor that graduated last in medical school? You call him doctor. He still graduated. He graduated last. But everybody is different. I, I'm a firm believer in first personalized medicine because, um, like, one person could be on Coumadin, which is a blood thinner, and, you know, so that they can't have any leafy greens while one per person is you know, four stage on Hopkins lymphoma, which, you know, they need you to bump up their leafy greens because like leafy greens, you know, it increases your red blood count. 
and you need that as a cancer patient. So it's like everybody's diet is different. Some people are like thrive off being a plant-based only diet. Some people really, really thrive off being on the keto diet, which is mainly meats and protein. So it's, everybody is different. So, and that's why I do believe in personalized medicine. And also wh whatever gives you relief, what, whatever aids your, like, aids your pain, like, you know, more power to that. Right. And, I believe everybody in this world has to have a quality of life and it should be able to feel good just to be able to do your daily day, your daily day, like right. the market, picking up your daughter from school. Um, you know, just, you have a headache. Well, what's, what's so wrong with, you know, actually going home and saying, Oh, like I want to take a little, little edible to help me go to sleep, you know, versus, Oh, let me drink a glass of wine or, you know, let me take a Xanax because I'm having a little bit of anxiety. Like benzos, mm -hmm. opioids, and all of that, that's been proven. Right. Um, that's been proven to do harm. Right. It's been proven to be highly addictive. Yeah. So so, so people are, are on this journey now to learn how they can, you know, partake with cannabis without having to smoke um, and really understand how they can match it with their... Um, their symptoms that you talked about. People are dealing with so many things. And I love that you said that people are supposed to just be whole. Like, I think in our country, we're so used to having issues. We don't realize what it's like to be whole and to feel good, you know? So in your book, The Happy Chef, The Happy Chef Cannabis Cookbook, what was your vision for medical marijuana patients, how, how they would use this book? Like, how did you envision that happening? Well, the, the main drive because I was already in the cannabis space. I was making edibles with Prop 215, was working with Dr. Green Thumb. And I remember presenting it to B, saying, you know, like- Be meaning be real from Cypress Hill. <laughs> Sorry. For all of us, you know. I remember when I first presented it to be real. And uh, we were actually here in Vegas. He, he, had, he had booked, um, he had a DJ gig as DJ Dr. Green Thumb. And I was talking to him about it because I had my article, The Happy Chef, I had my, my recipe blog. And at that time, I, of course, like, you know, this is my passion, this is what I love to do. So I, I purchased all these amazing, you know, cannabis cookbooks. And what I realized is that, you know, a lot, a lot of us are very protective of our IP, which, which I, I completely understand it and as am I. However, edibles have continued to have a bad name because none of us have actually given the right information for somebody to dose themselves properly. Mm -hmm. It's always every cookbook that I got, and you know, you know, like I'm very grateful to all those chefs. But every single cookbook that I purchased, it was almost like they all mirrored each other. It was four sticks of butter and an ounce of cannabis. Four sticks of butter and an ounce of cannabis, and you know, and then they're like, put the put the butter in as the recipe calls for it. Well, that you don't tell me anything about milligrams. You don't tell me anything about you know how that's going to make me feel. And which is why everybody has had an adverse effect on edibles. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I did a smoke box recently with, with Be Real and Cypress Hill on his network, Be Real TV. He does the smoke box. And that's exactly what I talked about is that everyone has had a bad edible experience. And not to even mention, not everybody is, you know, in the culinary field. So people don't know uh, how to bind cannabis like properly with, you know, there's flash points of cooking oil. There's certain cooking oils that you use for low temp cooking, high tip cooking, mid tip cooking. None of that is explained in all these other cookbooks that I purchased. And even though the recipes are delicious, I, I want people to enjoy the plant like I do. Right. Because, like, and, and everybody can enjoy the plant. You can OD on water. You can, you can have an adverse effect on anything and mm -hmm. everything. Too much of, of anything is bad for you. So, but if you actually can get your, to your level from your body mass and your tolerance to, and also your strain, different strains for different pains. That's another thing I break down. I break down the herb and like, it's the, like how it's grown and why it got its scientific names and, you know, the, the boiling points of the compound. I want you to be able to maximize your medicine. There's terpenoids in the plant that have very low boiling points that you can cook off. You know, depending on what you're making, if you're making hard candies and lozenges, uh, your hardening point is at 310, 315 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, you're, you're boiling off all that lean a little, all your, you're, you're boiling off the compounds that you need. So right. you might want to switch that to a different recipe, to something that's more lower, something where you can maximize the benefits of something that you need personally. Right. So I wanted, and I also wanted to show that, you know, cause like even so I'm in California and in Las Vegas, 
and two recreationally legal states. And I came from Colorado with like my, my mentor, Sean Gower, at Rocky Mountain High. I love him to death. But you come from these states where it's so very openly and widely accepted that when I go back home to Virginia, you know, I'm still like, oh, she's the pot brownie maker. Mm -hmm. you know? And, it, and, and I'm all like, oh, goodness, if you saw the very expensive equipment that I get to work with, you right. definitely wouldn't, wouldn't say I just meet big pot brownies. So. Right, right. So you, you kind of see in this, this interesting place, because uh, again, scientists like Dr. Russo and, uh, and uh, you know, Dr. Mishulam and these gentlemen, they're talking about clinical trials that, you know, are showing the efficacy of, these, of this plant. And those clinical trials are expensive and they're not being done because no one's paying to do them unless they get, I guess they can patent the drug or whatever. And then you have people who are at home and this is the lay person and they're just making brownies for themselves or they're smoking and they're taking the plant and whatever they can figure out on their own. So you sit in this kind of middle place where, you know, it's not a clinical trial, but you have the scientific uh, research that you're doing in the lab where you are to kind of give a little bit more context and specificity as to what people can be taking, what dosage, what milligrams, et cetera. Yes. Interesting. And, and, and honestly, it has, it has it's, the, it's the compound of both worlds, to be, to be very honest. This whole industry started off as a, as a black market industry. None of us were able to like really study it the way it's deserved. And like, you know, it was at one point like, mandatory for farmers to grow hemp and everything and then over the years was bastardized through propaganda and everything and like now all of a sudden it's coming to fruit and now everybody wants a piece of the screen rush so now we're finally starting to get some attention now the brands are starting to get recognition but also a scary thing is that you know really big money is coming in which which i want everything to be federally decriminalized i do like it, it, really, it really really saddened me that um, i was on um, a show on Netflix that was called Cooking on High, and I was on three episodes, and an interview that I did after that show was they're like, oh, what exciting times, you know, like, uh, how do you feel about being on, you know, an international television series? And, you know, I was like, you know, it feels really kind of, feels, feels good, but not really, because, you know, here I am cooking with the plant on television, like, for people's entertainment, and the people that are viewing it have some a loved one that's locked up. Right. I mean, I have fans that just that told me that they still have problems in other states where they're being, you know, incarcerated for like an ounce or like an eighth or a joint. And it's just, you know, I keep realizing that we still have a long way to go. Right. Right. And, but but more research and more trials need to be done because we we need to find out everything about this plant. Right. Right. So you mentioned just the, the catch-22 that we're in, where we, we need the research to go forward. At the same time, it's, you know, um, legally from a criminalization standpoint, it needs to, to be decriminalized on that, on that level. And then also you talk about people who are just trying to get in just to cash in. So it's this delicate balance that needs to happen, right? Where the integrity needs to stay in place, but we do need you know, the outside uh, federal organizations to get involved to help it so that it can grow, the industry can move forward. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, every, every day I see it and it's something that really, really saddens me because I've loved, I've loved my industry. I love everybody in it. Uh, I have the greatest, closest friends that, and I have, I also have many that have already kind of folded because, because of all the big money that is coming in. It's like not, the mom and pops are having a hard time keeping up, you know, with these new regulations and, you know, the, the state will say, oh, you know, oh, edibles, you, you need to have warnings that are at eight point font and blah, blah, blah. Then the edible company spends twenty some thousand dollars on packaging for, you know, exactly the way it's the regulation state they're supposed to be. And then four weeks later, they say it has to be a 10 point font or something like outrageous. And then there you went, you just trashed like mom and pops can't do these things. Right. You know, this is, like, this is easy for somebody, which is something I, I worry about once it gets federally legal, you know, then you're going to have all these people like Coca-Cola and all this big trillion billion dollar people that are going to come in. And I am nervous to see that because all the pioneers that started the industry that kept it going, like, you know, risking that orange jumpsuit every day of their life for a plant. Right. I, I realize that, you know, 
some of them are going to get weeded out. And that's what disheartens me is because they were some of like, you know, they, they really believed in it as pure. They didn't do this for money. The people that I know don't do this for money. The people I know do this because it's right. Because right. It's a plant, you made nature illegal. This is a plant. This is an herb that's been used in cultures and civilizations for centuries and centuries and centuries. And, and guess what? It helps me. I, oh, yeah, and I think you, you and I talked about it when we talked about a be real sacred cell and um, different artists being patients. And I, like I, I stated that I always end up getting talked to about, oh, you know, the, you know, rappers and, you know, hip hop artists, you know, they, they promote the plant, like, you know, quite, quite a lot. And I remember talking to you that I'm like, the, when these, when I see these artists, I call them patients. Mm -hmm. because what like in my head like i told you there our bodies are not supposed to be going to these elevations right. like we we are grounder ground walkers we're not supposed to be you know flying okay here you go you're in tokyo oh now you're in australia oh now i got a gig and this is 24 hours oh i'm in vancouver and oh now i'm in germany and oh and i'm in france and then they are in elevations and planes like i have artists that have writers where they get ivs with b12 whenever they take off and land and not to mention the stress from just society, press, social media, like trolls, just negative, negative energies coming at them from all directions, just for them wanting to do their art, for right. do, for wanting to do something that they love, that they have their fans that are down with. They have to get a lot of hate from other people. Like, and what I've told you, could you imagine the amount of prescription drugs that they would be on if right. cannabis didn't exist? I love that. I love, I love that you elucidated that when we spoke before. Because I think that people really don't get it. I, I know that they don't. You know that they don't. Because you know, you know, artists are to them just for their entertainment pleasure. Yeah. And it's like what happened with Michael Jackson. People, it's just about always attacking the artists and putting them in in the spotlight, not realizing that these are regular people who are enduring a extreme amount of stress to be able to do something creative and bring entertainment and artwork to the world. So you're saying that if it wasn't for cannabis. Uh, which is a benign uh, type of, 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 of element that they can, that's a, from, the, from the earth, it's a plant, everyone should have access to it. And if it wasn't for cannabis, they would be on harder drugs. Yeah. Wow. Be. And, and, you know, and, and that goes, again, I'm a firm believer in the whole plant and I'm a firm believer in whole plant medicine when it comes to any plant. The thing I was telling you, there's a, a herb called a willow bark tea. And that was used a century or so ago in like World War II times to aid like pain, pain relief. Well, like a century later, that drug became aspirin. Now, willow bark tea, it's, if, you could, if you drink it and drink it, like your body is actually going to tell you when, like, you know, when you've had enough, but you're not going to overdose. But once you've cut something and synthesized it, that's when you've actually removed compounds that actually keep it safe. Right, right. And that's what happens. That's that, again, that's that fine line, right? Because you want the research to happen for, from, from, uh, for, for cannabis. Unfortunately, all the research is funded by pharmaceutical companies and, you know, our government does not fund research. So if there's going to be research, it's going to be a company that's looking to essentially extract, isolate, and uh, patent something in the plant that they would essentially own and then sell back to the community uh, at a high premium. So it's, it's a very, very hard place to be in for people like you who are lo really looking to make sure that uh, everyone has access to the ability to, in their own home, in their own kitchen, be able to enjoy something and to, to have to make their own medicine and empower them to make their own medicine. So let's talk a little bit about some of the folks. I read some of the reviews um, and uh, people were just really excited about what you had done and they thanked you for the practical yet scientific approach in The Happy Chef. What did you include in the book specifically that was different from the typical Oedipal's book? You, yeah. How you can dose yourself at home. As I told you, I grew up farm to table, and my and my parents still live in that little time capsule. It's, 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 it's I so love it though. It's like a big thing now. They're like that's like the hot trend, and they've they've been doing it all their lives. Yeah, they just keep doing it. And they, you know, it's, it's, I love talk, I love my parents. They're, they have an amazing, very 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 supportive family, and um, it wasn't always like that. So uh, there was it was actually I told you I'm from Virginia. So when I wrote the Happy Chefs, we were talking about it. Um, I I was the first cannabis chef that actually put her face 
on a cannabis cookbook, and I still do. I, I, I promote the plant. This is me, myself, and I. I'm making these things. I'm doing this R&D. I, I, I work in this, and I, and I will put my face on everything I do because I stand behind what I do. But I remember when I was so happy when I got my cookbook hard copy in my hand and I sent it back home to my dad. And my dad called me and he said, I raised you smarter than this. Wow. You put your face. Now, mind you, this was 2013. That so was like was, five years ago. Six, five, five, six years ago. So it wasn't, the cannabis plant wasn't as you know popular as it is right now. So, and my, and my family's from Virginia, so my father was just like, I raised you smarter than this. You, you put your face on, on a weed cookbook. Your, your mother and I are going to be coming and visit you in some California state prison. And oh, my God. And I'm just like, Dad, am I like, you know, like, like I, I don't see anything wrong with it. And, like, times are changing. I had to, like, you know. I, I, I them. Them. Educate them. <laughs> I really had to educate them for a while. And now my parents are my biggest fans. Awesome. So. So it's, it's cute how it changed, but to go back to what you what you'd asked me, what I did is when I collected all the all the other cookbooks that were around, I noticed that you know, and I also noticed that you know, there's tasty videos that are out. There's all these things, but as I told you that, I, it, it, just in my roommate experience of, of a career of having roommates, I realized that not that many people are culinary savvy enough when it comes to like cooking oils, as I told you, like with mid tip, low tip, high tip, and you know, they're definitely not used to you know cooking with the plant. And all the other cookbooks that I collected did not teach you how to dose yourself. So I break down, one, I break down the history of the plant. I break down research. I give research and articles and books and so that you can go and dive deeper if you'd like to. But I also give you charts where I give you exactly how to dose your milligrams, how to infuse and dose your batch to the fats, to the lipids that you need to with the boiling points of, of all the compounds in the plant with also the flashpoints of all the cooking oils. Mm -hmm. but, but the way I broke it down was very simple. Like, like I, I tried to, you know, I made up like cute nicknames for things. So that just the common, you know, the 88 year old lady that just has a little bit of arthritis could, could dose herself properly, you know, which is, a, which is another thing. Like, you know, cannabis has gotten insanely more potent now than it was in the 70s. My mother still asks me, she goes, when can I, when can they bring back 70s cannabis? Like, <laughs> she's like, can somebody bring that back, please? Because this stuff is so strong. And, you know, so what I do is I teach you that, but also I have like a happy section where I have a bunch of just fun, like sweet recipes for the sweet tooth. And then I have a healthy section where I teach like cannabis juicing and, you know, more like using like plant-based only herbal remedies. And, and I bring it down that way. So the main thing I wanted to, to break down to people is exactly how to dose themselves because I, I've been having to fight in this industry for so much of just keeping edibles around, right. you know, from, from it being the child friendly use molds to, you know, like homogenizing tests to, you know, everything like we've, we in the edible industry, you know, like we can't even use, we have to use childproof packaging. You know, which you know, I'm trying to be eco-friendly and make my stuff be cardboard and, you know, good for, good for the earth. It's difficult to find. And I'm glad I'm saying this because hopefully somebody watches this interview and invents one, please. Right. But, <laughs> but uh, like, you have to use childproof packaging, which is majority plastic. And, you know, alcohol companies don't need to do that. I can go to 7-Eleven and crack open a beer with just a little twist top. But you make things so difficult for an edible company to not use bright colors like, you know, there's almost no branding. It's like, you, because everything, you can't even say, we, we can't even have a fruit. We can't even have the picture of a fruit to, to distinguish the flavor on our packages. Wow. And that's how much the, the industry has changed. And it's in that those kind of regulations, they come at us every two, three months. And we're just, we're just kind of like, okay, let's just make it as simple packaging as possible and there's no colors remove the flavor fruit we'll just write the flavor and 10 point wow. so people are wondering why it's so bland this is the reason why the packaging and everything is so bland i was talking with an attorney uh about this same issue about how the regulations are just changing every other week you yeah. know and companies you mentioned about companies folding because they cannot keep up with the changes that are required in order to be in this gray space but you're saying, you know what, we got to push through because this is important, right? 
So it's important for, for these type of people. Now you are working with medical marijuana patients. These people want to use edibles instead of smoking uh, or vaping or other formats. What types of conditions are they treating? Like what are we, what are you mostly seeing? What am I, what I'm mostly seeing? Well, first, uh, with my patients, I've noticed there's not a lot of plant, plant-based only, uh, with, you know, with, with vegan and, um, plant-based diets, not to even mention the, the gluten allergies and, and honestly, the, the food allergies. I, myself, I have a peanut allergy. So um, it, it, it's, it's difficult to find these things in collectives. And it's also difficult to find levels that you need. Like I, I do YouTube videos where I, I kind of break down things in a more fun way about that, that, that there are levels to this. Right. And, you know, like it, When you say levels, you mean levels of THC to CBD? Like what do you mean by levels? Absolutely. So if you, if you have RLS or epilepsy or, or night tremors, like Parkinson's patients, Parkinson's patients that they have, they have horrible night, they, first they have horrible tremors, uh, and they, but also they have horrible night tremors and horrible nightmares. Wow. So their body literally never sleeps. Now, if a bud tender, which I'm not certain I like that name for, for, for them, but if a bud tender isn't uh, knowledgeable enough on the level saying like, okay, you, you have like a safe, and this would be the same kind of symptom, symptom or dose for an RLS patient. Anything with tremors, epilepsy, you would want them to have a more stronger, uh, on the end, cannabis indica side, mm -hmm. but you want them to have levels of like beta carotene and large levels of lenalool, uh, large levels of CBN, so that would help them sleep. But CBN and lenalool together, that acts as a nice relaxant so that it will actually relax your nerves in your body. And like, but they're not knowledgeable enough to say that to you. So when you go into a collective, you are literally- Dispensary is a collective. Yeah, it's a dispensary. Okay. But you're literally, you know, so say you're a Parkinson's patient and you're in your seventies and you're looking up at the menu and it's like a cheesecake factory menu. <laughs> yes, you're going to the choices. You're coming through Bush, you're looking at all these hundreds of choices and all these different things and everything is confusing. You see strain names like Alaskan Thunder, F-O-G, and you know, just craziness. And, and you, you don't know what these things are. You're just kind of like, okay, uh, I guess I'll take strawberry cough. And, um, and, then, and then what happens? You have an adverse effect. You know, you might get something like strawberry cough as a high strain sativa, or like a Jack Harrer, Super Jack number one to a Parkinson's patient, it might make them shake more. It mm -hmm. might actually make their condition worse. Mm -hmm. There are levels to this and that right. it, it is medicine and there are different strains for different pains. And you so, said that the butt, it's really the butt tender who is the person who you see when you go into the dispensary, right? That's yeah. the person who consults with you. You're yeah. saying the butt tenders need to be versed on not just the names of all of these products that they have, but what's inside of them and how these things, the levels of THC, CBD, and how these things interact with various conditions. Yeah. They wow. They, they do, because but, technically that they are your pharmacist. Right. If you wanna get down to it, uh, I mean, yes, yes, I am in a recreational state, but they are your pharmacist. They're the ones that are like leading you to, to your proper medicine and your proper dose. So when a person gets a medical marijuana, uh, I guess, license, uh, does the doctor assist the patient in regards to guiding them to the right uh, products for their condition? How does that whole thing work? Before they even get to the dispensary, the doctor gives them the prescription. You're talking about the physician that I would actually give you your medical marijuana patient card, correct? Right, your card, yes. No, no they do not. And that, that's something I, I don't know if uh, collectives or dispensaries should have maybe a physician on hand somebody that extensively studies the plant like myself or someone that's in research or someone that was maybe maybe works at a lab even but um no the, the doctor mainly they they look at your medical charts and they look at your conditions and you as the patient because this is patient choice it's you are choosing a more herbalist holistic medicine and you and you have all Basically, you have all the key point words. Oh, you have arthritis, chronic pain, cancer, epilepsy, and then they're like, yes, we can give you a script so that you can go get medical marijuana. However, they do not lead you to the strain that you need. Mm -hmm. So the doctor leaves you with a license and says, go forth. Yes, go forth, be with you. <laughs> and, if, 
<laughs> right. And then you walk into the cheesecake factory of dispensaries and you're overwhelmed yeah. trying to figure out the right solution. And, and maybe they may have someone on hand that can give you some real guidance in regards to specific strains and levels that you need. But a lot of times they don't. Hmm. So the, uh, they're, they're treating all of those conditions. Now, are people, you know, how do we know which strain of medical marijuana is best for a condition? Is, that, is there some sort of, a, I know you may know, but is there, where do people find out about this? I mean, I, they can read the Happy Chef. That's going to give them specific things about cooking. But where do they find out which strains are good for which conditions? Because the doctor doesn't tell them. No, the doctor doesn't tell them. Uh, I've met, I have met and been into dispensaries that are very knowledgeable and that, that can lead you to. They are, they are very few and far between. Now, uh, some, of the, some of us like myself, and, it's, and I don't just do, do this like with, with my book. My book is kind of a nice, like it's, um, I, I call it a textbook. Mm -hmm. Like even, even with when, when my friends, like I just put out the second edition. I had my girlfriend, Dr. Dina. She, she told me, she goes, you should do Happy Chef Goes to France and Happy Chef Goes to Italy. And I said, well, that's fine. But the first like six, seven chapters of my book are going to be the same. Right. And it's working with medicine. It is science. So, and science is updated when new research and stuff comes available. Right. So I then will update the edition. However, I do put, because I realize not all of us, you know, like, um, I realize I, I put out a lot of free information right. on my website. I do break down different strains and I also break down elements. I have, uh, I have a section for natural medicine on my website that says, um, it, it says patient name and it says diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. And I literally break down science of everything that I research about diverticulitis. I give you foods that you need to stay away from foods that you need to go to. And then I also break down what cannabis strains are good for you for that ailment. And I do that for, I do that for many ailments. And so it's like, I try to like put these blog articles out just because I actually, I, I want everybody to just feel good. Right. And, and the thing about diverticulitis is probably not a condition that you can get a license for medical marijuana for most yeah. people. And it's a very painful, 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 painful ailment. And like I have, I have patients that have literally had surgeries, part of their intestines removed. They're in the hospital with bloating, and it's very painful. And what what can cannabis do for something like that? I guess it's definitely inflammation and pain that it can help them to. But, but it, and not even just cannabis. So if you want to brew like a cannabis tea, there's different herbs that you can use that are amazing for inflammation. One of them being cast claw. Cast claw is an amazing herb. It's, it's fabulous for inf for inflammation. I mean, the, the benefits of cat of cat's claw is almost as long as CBD or even beta carrier filing, which mm -hmm. is a terpenoid that's found in cannabis. That was actually it was a it was it's a terpenoid, but it was falsely identified as a cannabinoid when it first came out because it's a terpenoid that's in everything. Mm -hmm. And normally, when it's in every single strain, it, it was labeled to be a cannabinoid because you know can cannabinoids are in all cannabis. Yes. Terpenes is what signifies what type of cannabis it is. Mm -hmm. Because of where it's grown, you have like like linalool and stuff that linalool is stuff that's found. That's a terpenoid that's found in the indicas grown in like the northern colder climates where you would find something like limoline, which is we call them fruits, which is grown into the sativa, you know, uh, species where they're grown in the mainly tropical areas. Which, you know, and, and if you look at how it's broken down, sativas keep you awake, you have limoline in it. So limoline, that's citrus. So it's an antibacterial and also it makes you awake. Well, I drink orange juice and it gives me energy. And oh, what's in my, what's in my pine saw? Oh, that'd be limoline for an antibacterial to clean my house. Then you look at compounds in the indica side, you look at linalool. Oh, linalool makes up, it's one is in the mint family. So it's found in basil, cilantro, mint, uh, but it's also found in lavender. It makes up 60 some percent of lavender. So you have that. Oh, what is lavender used for? For centuries and centuries as a relaxant mm -hmm. in massage therapy. And it's used, you know, so it's, when you look at the compounds, you actually can see exactly what they do. Wow. If you, like, I, I know I'm kind of spoiled in this because, because of the information that I, that I have of going into a dispensary and looking at a lab test and looking at the label. And I know, I know how I'm going to feel by the lab results on the back. Wow, wow. I want, I want all patients to get that good. Right. I want all patients to be able to look 
and be like, oh, this has this level and this level and this level. Okay, good. Now I know exactly how I'm going to get. Just like when the pharmacist goes to you, they give you all the pieces of paper that tells you what it does and side effects and everything. I, I think that cannabis should get to that point. That's super exciting, especially knowing, again, how long it takes for actual drugs to be able to hit the market and how slow it's been so far. It seems to me that people are going to dose themselves. They're going to self-medicate. And if they're going to do that, let's make sure they get the information to be able to really customize a solution for whatever it is that's ailing them. Is this what you're doing in the lab? When you're in the lab, you are doing all of these tests on cannabis to allow you to see uh, what's happening with the plan and what percentages to put in. I do my research and development with myself and also with my patients. Um, with all medical marijuana patients, I always ask them, I'm like, please keep a journal, keep a daily diary, let me know how you feel. And like, same thing, like in any medicine that I make, I, I pay very close attention to my body and what goes in my body. Like, um, you know, basically, like, I don't need anything that comes in a box. I'm, I'm very all, all natural, everything. So in the, in the same premise is what I want to teach all the patients is that, you know, be very careful because organic doesn't work very well with synthetic. And mm -hmm. any holistic or herbalist will tell you the same thing. It's just like, it's like benzos. There's something that blocks, like something from the plant to actually do what it really needs to do. Right. So, so with this, I, I want to get this information from these patients because one, it helps me also it helps me guide other patients with the same ailment to the right medicine. Mm -hmm. data. And that's something that the cannabis industry is lacking in itself is just data. Which, right. and, and to answer your question, that is something that I've done on myself. That, like I, I use my lab work for finding out levels and potencies and stuff like that. I, I honestly use my patients to give me the real information of how they feel and how it's helping them. Right. So, Ooh, there's a lot. Okay, so let's do a little one-on-one -on -one for people. Let's get them into some practical usages. What do we need to know before we start putting cannabis in food? What's the science behind it? What makes it beneficial for treatment of medical conditions? Let's talk about terpenes, cannabinoids, and the cannabinoids. What do we need to know before we start throwing it into our drinks or our desserts? You definitely need to know, you need to know the total potency of what you're using. So if you're using flour or concentrate, um, which I would probably, I'd recommend using a crude oil or um, a lot of people call it RSO or which is Rick Simpson oil, but um, that was made with naphtha like a long time ago. We, we don't even use that in the industry now. We use something less ethanol, more, more, a little more safe. But you want to know what the potency is of that oil because you can't continue to dose yourself and do your job without the actual potency. Right. Because you need to know the total potency so you can do your math and formulate to your single serving doses. So you need to know that. And the, the most important thing is in the decarb. Because your, your decarb could, can make or break you. You, could, you can either under maximize your potencies and benefits, or you can take them past their boiling point, make them carcinogenic even, and mm -hmm. just remove everything that you need. And just for folks, decarb oxalation is what? Decarboxylation is actually turning the compounds in the plant active. So it's like, so say like CBDA and THCA, that's the THCA is tetrahydrocannabinoid tetra acid. So the second you decarboxylate it, the acid atom drops off. So you're making those compounds active or, or more potent. Right. So uh, just to understand that a flower uh, in its natural form is not, uh, the cannabinoids are not decarboxylated. That's the THCA, the C, uh, CBDA. Uh, once you add uh, uh, heat to it, from what I understand, that's what drops off the, uh, the acid and that's what makes it decarboxylated. And that's when you start to get those effects like in THC, uh, you get the psychoactive components uh, that you, you notice in THC. That's when the effects that we, we learn about uh, the, well, a lot of some, there's actually some medical benefits uh, in the oh, acid yeah. forms as well, but, yeah. but people are most, most familiar with the, with the decarboxylated uh, effects. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and the same thing with broccoli and, and anything, it's like, it's good to eat the raw form and also the cooked form. I love that you keep bringing this, making this very, very simple because I think that, well, for me, you, you know, we think about cannabis, it's like a whole nother thing, but it's a plant. 
<laughs> so think about broccoli. Like when you cook broccoli, it does something different than when you have it raw. Yeah. Well, I, I this is one thing I like to break down to people. It's just like everything gets you high. People get you high. Energies get you high. Um, if I give you a glass of carrot juice, you're going to feel a certain kind of way. Just the same way as if I just told you I give you orange juice, you're going to feel a high. Now, it's not necessarily the same high that you're going to get off smoking, you know, you know, a big fatty from that, you know, like equivalent to Cypress Hill, you know, <laughs> of course, it's not going to give you the same high, but it's going to give you an effect. It's going to make you feel a kind of way that is a high. Mm -hmm. And if you use cannabis like an herb, like all other herbs you're most in, in my personal opinion you're going to dose yourself properly and you're not you're, you're not going to have adverse effects if you actually use it as an herb right like, like it is so right. if you put in teas and you know use it as a seasoning like you know that that's very popular as well with with many cooking shows uh infusing it into a coconut oil and using it as like a salve or like even like lotion like it has many benefits same as I had 22 healing herbs in my kitchen just for my apothecary topical line that weren't cannabis indica and cannabis sativa. Everything from St. John's wort to mugwort to cat's claw to, you know, oh, oh arnica. Arnica is amazing. Calendula. Like, you know, there's all these different herbs that work so well together. Right. And, and I believe cannabis to me, it is. It's an herb. Right. It's an herb. Like, yeah, it's, of course it's an herb. Like, duh, yeah. Like, what? You know, we, we get so complicated with it. Right? Yeah. And it's funny because, uh, again, the conversation about the clinical trials that are needed, and, and again, referring to conversations I've had with, with scientists, uh, you know, like Dr. Mishulam, who says that, you know, you should really be under a doctor's uh, guidance to use cannabis and that um, it's not something that um, people should be doing on their own. Uh, at the same time, it's an herb, it's a plant, it's from the earth we are able to manipulate and work with other herbs. So why is it that cannabis is different in that regard? So it's, it's a really, really interesting kind of space. I, I'd like to see just jump into 50 years in the future and see how this is all gonna turn out. Before I get to the future, let's talk about uh, pairing uh, you know, cannabis with food. So in the wine world, we pair wine with different, you know, different wines with fish or with, with beef and uh, with chicken, et cetera. Isn't there like a pairing that happens also with cannabis in terms of terpenes yeah. and things like that? Now, terpenes, again, just for definition, explain people what terpenes are. Terpenes, terpenoids, those are the basically the flavor compounds in the plant. It's also, it's, it's, it's how I told you, when I explain cannabis indica and cannabis sativa, because I will get questions, be like, what's the difference? And then you have hybrids and ruderalis, where, where basically you took an indica and a sativa and you put them together and you made a baby. So then they have compounds of both traits in them, right? So when I break down cannabis indica and cannabis sativa, it's, uh, the reason why they're named differently is because of their harvest time. Indica is harvested at a shorter period of time than sativas, but also where they're grown. So you have your sativas or your fruits that are grown in like warm tropical climates that tend to have like limonene and stuff like that. So limonene, it's citrus. So like when you think citrus, like definitely pair that with, you know, like uh, honestly any fruit, um, well, that citrus kind of goes along with everything. So you can even pair with a nice salmon or, you know, anything of that nature. Then you would have like uh, your indicas, which have like alpha beta pinene, which is very piney, earthy taste. You know, you would pair that with more like of a red wine, like more of an earth, like earthy undertones, like mushroom kind of like, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I love. Like, my family. Well, you're making me excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so all are delicious. Yeah, so, so pairing cannabis, that's the next level, being able to step your cannabis game up, not only for, you know, looking at the medicinal benefits, but pairing it so that uh, you maximize the benefits of the plants while you're at the same time enjoying the flavor profiles of the plants. Yeah. Wow, I'm so excited, I gotta take some classes. Okay, so when you cook it with cannabis, there's techniques you call it called extraction and infusion, right? Um, they sound super scientific. What is this? And can a regular person do this at their home? Yes. Not necessarily the way we do it in the lab, but um, the extraction process is just the removal of plant matter from, from, the, from the compound. So you're, you're basically, you're getting all the good stuff that's in the plant off of the plant 
and you're like, you can do a flour to base, which is what I would, that's, that's something that you would do at home. So say you just have your raw herbs, you could put that in coconut oil and, you know, with a cheesecloth and, you know, uh, do like a double boiler kind of method so you don't over decarboxylate it. And, you know, uh, you do it at like a lower temp, usually I'm thinking like two, 240 Fahrenheit-ish. And, you know, that way you can maximize the compounds without breaking them out. But the thing about it is you're still going to have your chlorophyll in there. And that's what gives it like the, the plant-like taste. I like that taste. See, I love the taste <laughs> too. That's what, and, you know, it's, you can honestly really max it. Anyway. Yeah. Some people don't like it. And, um, and that's what I was telling you with uh, crude oil or Rick Simpson oil. So that is, you know, um, I would call it full spectrum because that's everything in the plant. Now, sometimes we'd purge out or like we would do winterized crude oil, which is, you know, that this is done, this is, an, uh, this is an extraction process that's done with usually ethanol or you could do it with CO2 as well. Um, but sometimes they'll take that up and do like fractional distillation, which any kind of distillation They've removed everything out of the plant except for the, the one element, except for delta nine, except for THC. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Because because in that extraction process, they literally, especially if they're doing hydrocarbon or butane uh, as their solvent, they have to remove. Uh, basically, they have to remove all the terpenes and all the other stuff out, um, extract it to that to dis to distillation, and then they put it back in. Ah. Uh, uh. Because if not, they'll just cook out everything. Right, right, right. But most because of the industry and because of the, the culture, most people want those high level THCs. It's, you know, right. There actually, there actually was a point in time where we couldn't even give, give away cannabis because, <laughs> because we, we were medical. And when we were only medical, a lot of companies got their licenses and started grows that were very, very large. And, you know, you're in a state and you have, uh, you know, 10,000 medical marijuana patients. And there's, 22 of you with grows that are like you know thousands of square feet right thousands of hundred pounds you know hundreds of thousands of pounds a month and you can't even get rid of it and we can't sell it so like the higher potency would sell first uh. because that's what everyone wants everyone wants like and everyone's very proud to tell you, be like, yes, my head cheese tested at 33 point, and they come up with some sci-fi number of like an astronomical number. And, you know, that's the stuff that sells them. You know, even though I would prefer something that's a little on, a, on the lower side. But right. That's, that's the concentrate. Yeah. Well, no, that's, that would, that's the flower. A head cheese flower would, would range in the 30s. Oh, okay. Total power. So so this extraction process, they extract out all the THC through a method that gets rid of everything else. And then they- yeah, the, plant matter, the leaves, the stems, right. all that. You just get all the trichomes, the little glandular, yeah. all the crystals, they freeze and they drop off when we get all the medicine. Ah, and it doesn't include the other cannabinoids or is it just THC? It, at, at the first stage of extraction, it includes everything. Okay. That, that's when I was telling you, it's more like crude oil. It's more yes. like- First, that the, it has everything. It's the entourage effect. It's full spectrum. It has all the goodness. And that's acids, though, because it's not car decarboxylated yet. Right? No, not yet. Okay. So then they take it through different processes, and depending upon what process, you're going to get uh, other distillates, etc., etc., um, from this. And so a person is not going to be able to do all that. What can a person do in their home, though? Like, can they? They can do a basic process of you said, you know, putting something in cheesecloth with oil. I would say do a flower to base infusion, or even if they want to, the majority of collectives or dispensaries will sell a one gram uh, like syringe of, of oil. And you can ask for a full spectrum oil. They, they should all have it. I, I would prefer everyone to work with full spectrum. But if you get that in a syringe, then you can add that. You could either t take a drop of it and put it under your tongue for a sublingual effect, or you could actually take it and infuse a batch of gummies or hard candies or whatever recipe you're making, even olive oils, topicals. Coconut oil is an excellent one because you could use it as a cooking oil and as a topical. Um, well, you could actually use all, all of the vegetable oils really as that. But um, coconut oil would probably be my favorite because you could use for mid and high stamp bread range cookies as well. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. if you do a flour to base or even a syringe oil to that, that, that you are extracting. You are, you are taking the compounds out of the flour and removing them and putting them into coconut oil. Okay, okay. So now you have your coconut oil base with your 
your THC or your, your, all the cannabinoids in it and it's ready to go. And okay, what are some recommendations for medical marijuana patients who want to cook with cannabis? What can you, what's an easy thing to start with? An easy, simple recipe to take that oil and let's make something. Mm, that's a difficult one. I mean, do we, can we do brownies? Just throw it in a brownie? I guess that's, the, that's everybody knows that, right? Yeah, everyone knows that one. I, my favorite would have to be gummies. And it's also the top seller, just because um, the vast majority of, of people and patients love gummies. They even have gummy vitamins. They have like gummies, it's just kind of, kind of just sticks out to me. Not to mention you can actually make it single serving doses because they come in molds. So, so my favorite and probably is be something that I'd recommend most would be for, people, for patients to make gummies. And you can make gummies at home? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Very exciting. And there's a, they're my favorite. You can do them completely plant-based everything. You can do them with, you know, a gar gar, or if you, you can also do them with gelatin, which, you know, it's not vegan, but. That's not vegan, right. I am super excited. I think that people have now some practical information and about how they can do this. Um, we have gone all over the world here. I wish we could talk longer because, you know, it's so much more to talk about and we're going to have to bring you back to talk more to people about the power of cannabis and maximizing their medical cannabis and really getting, you know, the enjoyment out of the plant at the same time, enjoying the flavors, but also maximizing medicine. Um, it is a delight to talk with you. I am going to go and see if I can make something. I'm actually not in a legal state, so I guess I'll be using CBD. Um, but I'm going to make some stuff. You can use weight oil also. Okay. You, remember, you, you, could just, you can honestly just uh, order terpenes online, and you can get just just that compound. That compound is medicinal as well. You can lean a little, you can make, I have one patient that has just some anxiety problems and trouble sleeping that he can't do any THC whatsoever because he gets shrub tested at his job. He works, he, he works out here in the casinos in the union job. So he, he can't have anything in his system. I make him just terpenoid gummies. I make him lean a little gummies because it takes yeah. away his anxiety and then he takes two when he needs to go to sleep. I love that. Oh my God, I can't wait. We're gonna go and you can buy them online. We're gonna we're gonna talk some more. I'm gonna get my own like personal uh, recipe recommendations from you because this is exciting stuff. You have really shown us cannabis in a way that I don't think many people have seen before or heard before. The Happy Chef is your book. It's available on Amazon or wherever good books are are, are purchased. And uh, hopefully maybe we can get people a, a, a bonus to get a little excerpt so that they can take a look at it. And uh, yeah, we're gonna have, definitely have you back. Thank you so much, Dee, for all you do for the artist community, for your medical marijuana patients in Vegas, and just for the world with the information you're bringing forth. Thank you so much, Felicia, it's an honor.